Well, we are beginning a new series today uh, that's talking about relationships. When I look at churches, when I look at my own life, there's one universal truth that I've found, and it's simply this. We all long to belong. Every single person wants to feel like they matter to not just themselves, every single person who has ever lived wants to feel like they matter to other people. Like other people would be sad if they weren't there. We all long to belong. If, if, if any of you were Beatles fans uh, growing up, um, you remember the Eleanor Rigby song? Uh, the, the chorus went something, all the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? And what he's hitting on is this fact. We all experience loneliness, and we all wish we didn't. We all long to belong. It's the reason we say we when our favorite sports team is in the championship. Well, like when, when, when the Broncos won the Super Bowl and the Cubs won the World Series in 2016, I was like, yes, we did it. I didn't do anything. I sat on my couch and ate potato chips. I, I, they're the ones who did it. But we want to identify and say, we are in the championship game. It's the reason we call every group we are a part of a community. We have the black community, the LGBTQ community, the Jewish community, the NASCAR community, right? Everything is a community. We call the groups we are a part of, it's the blank community. It's the reason we join social media sites and share details of our lives. It's the reason we join clubs, uh, sports teams, groups, and participate in others in rally with others in rallies. It's the reason we get married. It's the reason that isolation is one of the most uh, devastating and damaging punishments you can give to criminals and to kids, <laughs> right? Uh, if, if you really want kids to feel the weight of what they're doing, what do you do? Go to your room. Well, what's the whole uh, point behind that? You were made for relationship, you long to belong, and because of your actions, we're going to separate you from the relationship. There's a reason that is devastating. Why? Because we were made for relationship as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have existed for eternity in perfect relationship with themselves. God made us in His image to relate to other people. That's why Jesus said the two greatest commandments are what? Love God and what? Love others. Can you do those in isolation? Can you truly love other people? Now some people would be like, try the most loving thing you can do is leave us. Okay? Uh, <laughs> okay? uh, but, but can you truly love others in isolation? No. You were made for relationships. But here's the disconnect. We want to feel like we're part of a community, but many of us, no matter which groups we are a part of, our relationships, our marriage, or our friendships, we still feel disconnected. Like, we, we, we're members of a local church, we're uh, in a marriage, we have friends at, at work or outside of work, but we still feel disconnected, like there's something that is not working about our relationships. We still feel alone, we feel disoriented. We look at our relationships and we go, okay, uh, I feel like this should be moving somewhere, but it's not, and I don't know what to do to make the relationships in my life more meaningful. And ultimately, we feel discontent. We go, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. No matter how many people I know, no matter how long I've been a part of my local church, no matter how long I've been married, no longer, matter how long I've been uh, a parent, no matter how long I've been working in the same cubicle next to that person at work, I still feel it doesn't matter. Like, I don't matter. No matter how much time you spend with people, no matter how many groups we are in, we still feel like our relationships remain superficial, meaningless, and unfulfilling. We still feel like our relationships are superficial, meaningless, and unfulfilling, and, and let's be honest, this is even true in the church. What I've found is this is especially true in the church. Uh, July, I will have been in ministry now in, in uh, a full-time capacity for 14 years. 14 years. Uh, I've been a part of six churches since I left home. Uh, in, uh, we went to Altoona Regular Baptist Church when I was in college. We went to, I went to Colfax, our youth pastor, uh, Garwin, Newton, Monroe. Here, is that six? Okay, don't count. Uh, and, but here's what I found. Here's one universal truth that I found. 
every single church experiences the same situation. Our relationships that should be the most significant aren't. Like some of us have meaningful relationships in the church, but what I've found is every church I go to, it doesn't matter which denomination, it doesn't matter what town, it doesn't matter the size of churches. I'm talking churches of 40 people, I'm talking churches of 225 people. Everyone experiences the feeling of going, I don't feel like I matter to anyone in my local church. I feel like if I'm there, like people are happy that I'm there, but that's where it ends. And I don't feel that true Christian fellowship, that true Christian connectivity, I don't feel community in my local church. And so people go from church to church to church thinking maybe the next one will feel like, you know what we find? It's the same thing everywhere we go because it is a universal human trait that we want community, but we don't know how to get it. We want community, but we don't know how to get it. And this has been going on since the beginning of the church. I love this. Philippians chapter 4. Paul writes to the church of Philippi, and he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in my, this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And then he says, I urge Judea and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Now, I, I, I think you have to understand the historical context. There wasn't a New Testament at this point, right? So Paul is writing a letter to the church of Philippi. The pastor gets up on a Sunday morning and goes, Hey, y'all, we got a letter from Paul today, and I can't wait to read it to you. And he gets up. I don't know why he's on the Okay? That's just how confused in the first century talk. Okay? And he, he read the letter from Paul, and this would be the first time the church would hear it. Apparently, there's two ladies in the church not getting along. And so, from the pulpit, Paul goes, I urge Judea and Syntyche to be in harmony. Can you just picture these two ladies and their feet going, oh. <laughs> sticking down, right? Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement, also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These were godly women that something had happened and they were not living in harmony in their local church. Because that happens. The hard thing about a church is this is a room full of sinners. You will sin in your local church and you will be sinned against. That's the hard reality. People will do dumb things to you in a local church. People will do self-centered, mean-spirited things. Why? Because they're sinners. And that's true in your marriage. That's true in your job. You know what I'm finding? My kids' parents are even sinners. Okay. No. Who would have thunk? Okay. And what do sinners do? Sin. And it's hard. And, and, and as we come into relationships, we end up filling pews in our mission, but not filling hearts. But God meant the church to be more than this. God meant the church to matter in your relationships. So our series that we're going to be doing uh, is based off of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. The writer of Hebrews says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Paul, uh, sorry, uh, the writer of Hebrews, um, is writing there, and as he's writing, he's trying to encourage Jews who were being tempted to run back to Judaism. They're going, this whole Jesus thing wasn't all it was cracked up to be. We're tired of being persecuted. We're tired of being attacked for our faith. We're tired of being separated from our community. We're going to go back to being good little Jews. And the writer of Hebrews is going, what are you doing? Don't run back. Jesus is better than everything you want to run back to. And he talks about the importance of relationships in keeping us moving forward in our faith. And he says, let us consider. Let's think about this for a moment. Let us consider how to stimulate ourselves <coughs> to love and good deeds. Is that what it says? Let us consider how to stimulate one another 
to loving good deeds. And then he says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And then I love it. I just I picture the writer of Hebrews going like this, as is the habit of some. Because it is a habit. It is a habit. Well, look, everything comes up and we go, well, I know I have church. I know I'm supposed to be with my church family today, but I'm tired. It was a long night. You know, I was out at the ball game last night, or I was out you know, at work last night, or I was out doing this, and, and so and I'm, I'm tired, I'm busy, all of those things. Why should I make my local church a priority? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing in. As we look in this series at four words for real relationships, we're going to be exploring how does the Bible say to build real, encouraging, authentic, and redemptive relationships that make a real difference in our lives. How do we move relationships in the church, even in our marriages, friendships, and workplaces, from the superficial to the significant, from filling pews to filling hearts, from indifference to making a difference? And here's, how, here, here, here's why this is so important. God calls us to be faithful to our local church. Why? Because God wants us to build relationships that matter. Your relationships do not exist to pass the time. God needs them for a bigger purpose than that. And here's the big idea I want you to get today. Re, uh, relationships are God's way of redeeming and restoring you. Relationships are God's way of redeeming and restoring you. Why is that? Because relationships are the environment for biblical growth and change. You cannot experience biblical growth and change without relationships. By relating to others and by allowing them to relate to us, we have opportunities to apply loving God and loving others in the real world. Relationships, how? Relationships both encourage and infuriate us, right? And you know how this is. Your spouse can be the greatest help and the greatest source of frustration. Your coworkers can be a lot of fun and they can just tick you off at times. Your church people can be incredibly helpful and sometimes they hurt. Sometimes they're careless. Sometimes they say dumb things. And it's hard, and it hurts. But both, whether your relationships are what they're supposed to be, or your relationships have a long way to go, both of them provide motivation and opportunity. When your relationships are the way they're supposed to be, what an encouraging and motivating thing that is. Man, and, and, and I hope that you have somebody in your life or people in your life that you look at and go, man, I could not have gotten through that season of my life if so-and-so hadn't been with me and walked through that. What an encouraging relationship. And then there's other people where you're like, man, I would not have grown like I needed to without, as Paul calls that, born in the flesh, right? Uh, that, that messenger of Satan uh, sent. God uses even infuriating people to build growth and change in our lives. And this should be nowhere more apparent, and no one should get this more than the local church. The local church should specialize in fostering meaningful relationships. And we're going to talk about why that is here in a little bit. The local church should specialize in helping people develop meaningful relationships that move us from a self-centered, lonely existence to loving God, loving others, and leading a life of meaning, purpose, and significance. Now, all that's great. All of us go, yes, man. How many of you would raise your hand without being obstinate and just being a, a, a pain in my side? Okay. How many of you would raise your hand and say, I think biblical relationships are a waste of time? Am I... I think biblical relationships are overrated. No. I just want to never be talked to by anybody ever. Some of you are like, I'm going to be talked to by a few less people. That's fair enough, okay? <laughs> All of us look at this and go, yes, that makes sense. But we're busy. But we're scared. 
but we've been hurt before by other people. Or but we aren't people people. My six-year-old has this thing where she air quotes everything, whether it means what she thinks it means or not. And so I go to bed early. She means you're going to bed early. What does that even mean? We are people people. Like I, I, I like being in church. I don't like having to interact with people. Right? So why should I invest myself in biblical relationships? And the first point we're going to look at is this morning is this. Godly relationships are built upon our union in Christ. Godly relationships are built upon our union in Christ. When we say union in Christ or union with Christ, here's what we mean. We have, uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 6. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We are members of Christ. When Christ died, we died. When Christ rose, we rose. When in God's record books, when he looks at us and he looks at our sin, he sees paid for. Why? Because we're connected to the one who paid for us. We are united with Christ. And Romans chapter 12, verse 5 says, So we who are many are one body in Christ. Now, if you just stop there, it's a uh, we're a team, me and God. There's a country song or something like goes like that. Uh, we're a team, me and God, and it's all about I don't need anybody else in my why. Well, if I just have God, that's all I need. And if that's where the verse stopped, I go, yeah, fine, cool. It's not where the verse stops. What does it say? So we who are many are one body in Christ and what? Say it with me. Individually, members of We are members of Christ and members of one another. When we believe, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He guides, empowers, convicts, and comforts us, but not just us. Don't miss this. The church is not just about you. It's about people. The church has always been about people. Elect of the Father, redeemed by the Son. Indwelt, regenerated, empowered, adopted by the Holy Spirit to conform us to the image of his Son, to be used by God to make disciples, build up the body of Christ, and worship him with every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. God's plan is not just about me. God's plan is to save me, to change me, to use me, to be a tool and an instrument in the lives of other people. That's God's end game. You say, but people just need to leave me alone and mind their own business. They're not the boss of me. They don't know me. What does Ephesians 5.21 say? Be what? Subject to who? One another in the fear of Christ. You mean people are supposed to know my business? Yes. You mean I'm actually accountable to other people? Yes. Remember that old line from uh, uh, Cain and Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? What's the answer in the church? Yes. I am responsible for your well-being. You are responsible for my well-being. When it comes to biblical relationships, I owe myself to you. And you owe yourself to me. That's what the body of Christ is. When you are in Christ, you belong to Christ and to his body. You are not just members of Christ, but members of one another. Just like a hand cannot function without the arm, the brain, or the stomach, and cannot ignore them, we exist for the sake of the body and not the other way around. The body doesn't exist so that the hand can function. The hand exists so that the body can function. Can you imagine everything in the body going, well, we got to send all of our nutrients and spend all of our time worrying about the hand, making sure it has everything it's needed, the foot falls off fine, but the hand, that's where it's at. You go, no. The hand exists for the overall well-being of the body. Because I am in Christ with others, I am in relationship with others. The old wine from Cain and Abel is true, but I am my brother's keeper. Godly relationships are built upon our union in Christ. But number two, godly relationships lead to growth. Godly relationships lead to growth. Last night at our uh, dinner party, uh, Scott read Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go right there. Ephesians chapter 4, 15 through 16. 
Paul says that speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building of itself in love. What happens when my body is healthy? My hands get healthy too. My feet get healthy too. My stomach is healthy too. When I feed the body, it's not just the stomach that benefits, it's everything that benefits. When we are learning and growing together and building meaningful relationships, that leads to growth in our individual lives, in our individual health, and the health of the church. I want you to look at two contrasts here between two different kinds of friendships and relationships. In Hebrews chapter tw uh, 3, verses 12 through 13, the writer of Hebrews gives us an example of the purpose of godly relationships. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, or day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Godly relationships both encourage us and help us avoid pitfalls. I want you to get that. Godly relationships both encourage us and help us avoid pitfalls. Why? Because according to Hebrews 3, I am prone to spiritual blindness. Now, if I am blind physically, I see that I'm blind. When I am blind spiritually, I don't see what I'm blind to. I don't see what's coming. I don't see what I'm uh, susceptible to. And man, isn't it so frustrating when people come into our lives and they, 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 they start telling us, hey, you need to watch it. You need to be careful. Because I don't want to be told I'm wrong any more than anyone. I actually made my greatest hobby in the world is being right. Okay? I love it. I practice it every day. I just love being right. I hate being wrong more than just about anything. Okay? But we are all prone to wrongness in our spiritual life. And we need godly relationships that will encourage us and point out the sin in our lives. By contrast, look at Proverbs chapter 22. Do not associate with a man given to anger. What does he mean? Don't be buddy-buddy with people who are prone to anger. Why? Or go with a hot-tempered man. Or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. Godly relationships encourage us and help us avoid pitfalls. Ungodly relationships teach us ungodly habits and ensnare us. Godly relationships encourage and help us avoid pitfalls. Ungodly relationships teach us ungodly habits and ensnare us. Uh, and I want you to think of the difference between, and when you look at the animal kingdom, between, big word, symbiotic relationships and parasitic relationships. A symbiotic relationship is this. Certain types of birds spend almost their entire life on the backs of rhinoceroses. What do they do there? They're kept safe from other predators, and they're eating the bugs off of these rhinos. They have a mutually beneficial relationship. A parasite is something that comes into your body and all it does is destroy you. Are the relationships you're building in your life for mutual growth and edification, or are you simply in those relationships to get from other people, or are you in relationships that all people do is take? Those are dangerous relationships to build your life upon. We need to build our relationships God on godly relationships, whether in church or in marriage or in your friendships. The relationships you invest in will determine the quality and direction of your life. The relationships you invest in will determine the quality and direction of your life. Uh, what does Paul say in, in, in 2 Corinthians? Bad company, what? Corrupts good morals. Does that mean never be friends with people who are uh, different than us? Does that mean don't be friends with non-Christians? Does that mean don't be friends with people who struggle? Of course not. But I need to have 
good, solid relationships in my life with good, solid people who love the Lord and who are growing and can encourage me and help me avoid pitfalls and whom I can encourage and help them avoid pitfalls. Jackie Robinson was the first black player to play in Major League Baseball. Uh, anybody remember what number he was? Number 42. Uh, breaking baseball's color barrier, he faced many. Uh, if, if you've ever seen the movie Jackie Robinson, uh, it was an amazing movie. A lot of language problems in there, so I, I'll just make a, a little uh, um, warning. But in this movie, one of the scenes that I'll never forget is at one particular time, the, uh, they, they come to, uh, I, I don't even remember what city it is, it doesn't matter, but the team arrives and they're warming up, and people in the crowds are hurling all kinds of insults and racial uh, 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 smears at Jackie. And shortstop, Pee Wee Reese comes over and puts his arm around him. And he just stands there and looks at the crowd and smiles. And the crowd grows deathly silent. Jackie Robinson, looking back on that uh, moment, said, if it wasn't for that moment, I would have quit that day. That's what good relationships do in our lives. They encourage us, and they help us avoid pitfalls. And then number three, godly relationships take work. Godly relationships take work. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, Paul says, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. You say, well, well what about my complaint? Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing who? One another. Is this written to pastors? Does it include pastors? Yeah. Is it written to pastors? No. Who's supposed to be teaching and admonishing you? Each other. With songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Do any of these things that Paul tells us to put on come naturally to our hearts? No. No, they don't. See, sin is the default mode of the human heart. And even after we are saved, we still have this old nature that continually fights against the things of God. That says, I see what God's word says, but I'd rather do this. But I want this instead. And it is a war in the heart to say, am I going to put the work into biblical relationships, or am I going to use laziness, even my past, as an excuse to not be involved in the lives of other people? No amount of sitting in pews, sharing a house together, or working in an office together will lead to meaningful relationships. Sardines in a can don't love each other. Just because you're in the same room with people for a year. Some of you have been a part of this church for 50 years. Praise the Lord. Doesn't mean you have meaningful relationships with people. They take intentionality. They take dedication. Time, effort, grace, and character. It takes talking to people, listening to people, and a dedication to care more about giving to others than giving to yourself. But, here's the point, the benefits are incredibly worth it. I was thinking last night, how do I illustrate this? Uh, when I was uh, 15, I went to senior high camp, and uh, I met this guy that looked like a human version of Gumby. Um, uh, and he just was this um, goofy toothpick on legs that just ran around and him and I got talking and we kind of hit it off well. And then a couple months later, uh, I'm home in Grinnell and mom and dad come into my room and say, can we talk to you? I said, okay. And they go, we're moving. 
once we got here three and a half years ago, how are we moving again? And uh, so we're moving to Clear Lake. Um, the uh, uh, dad's got a job up in Mason City, and uh, there's this guy that we, uh, you remember Pastor Steve Cox? And I said, yeah, I was the guy that runs family camp. And they said, well, we want to go and help that church grow, so we're moving to Clear Lake. But I don't know anybody there. Well, I didn't realize that this toothpick on legs was Pastor Steve Cox's son, Daniel. If any of you know him, you can tell him I said that. <laughs> and Daniel and I spent the last year and a half of our high school together. Then we went to college together. And Daniel became the most meaningful human relationship I've ever had. Daniel and I fought like brothers. <laughs> We would yell at each other, we'd push each other, shove, we'd get in wrestling matches, we'd lose our tempers with one another. But there has never been a person in my life who has encouraged me in the things of the Lord more than Daniel. Daniel led me to the Lord when I was 16 years old. Daniel has been a trusted friend and confidant. And I am where I am today because I developed a meaningful relationship with somebody in my local church that has changed my life forever. It takes work. Man, there are times where we're like, we're never talking again. I'm so glad we were just texting this week, and uh, I get texts from them often. I text them, how can I be praying for you this week? You need to have relationships that encourage you to walk with Christ. Relationships that are meaningful, but they don't just happen. They happen when you commit to stepping out of your comfort zone and to saying, I care more about you than I do about my Sunday afternoon. I care more about you than I do about my Thursday nights. I care more about you than I do about this image that I want people to think of me. That's why we don't let our guard down, right? It's because we want people to think of us in a certain way. If I open up that, hey, I'm just as screwed up as everybody else is, then you might not like me. It takes honesty and it takes transparency, but the results are so worth it because they lead to growth and change and new so in the next few weeks, here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing a series, How to Build Relationships that Matter. And we're going to be looking at four words for building authentic community. How do we love people well? How do we truly get to know people in a way that leads to being used by God? How do we speak with one another in a way that encourages growth? And how do we do life together and help one another in this path? Some of you will recognize this in the book, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, Paul Tripp talks about how do we form helpful, redemptive relationships. He talks about how do we love people well, how do we know people well, how do we speak truth well, and how do we do. For the faith students, what, 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 what uh, classes do you use this book in? Your what? Counseling classes. Why? Because all biblical counseling is, is building intentionally redemptive, helpful relationships. That's all it is. It is, uh, as my friend Jeff Newman says, discipleship in the details of life. It is walking with another believer in a way that is mutually encouraging and challenging. So what we're going to be doing is how do we apply that to a church as a whole? I hope you're excited about this. I am. I'm thrilled to be walking through this. Next week, we're going to talk about how do we build truly loving relationships with others. How do we enter into each other's world in a way that says, I care about you.